Hello, I am Frankie Marr, and fabulously, I still haven't been fired. So I'm still here. Welcome to On the Edge. Live, uh, it's live, interactive, and uh, as usual, you, if you want to participate in the show, you can just call the number at the top of the screen. Now, this week, I am going to be speaking to a friend of mine, um, someone I've known for quite a while, and amongst other things, he is the official energy consultant of the Complementary Medical Association. Uh, he's also something called a bioenergy therapist and instructor, and his name is Dan Kahn. Hello, Dan. Welcome to the show. Hello, How Frankie. Thank you very much for having me on. You are more than welcome. Now, Dan, first of all, um, what exactly is bioenergy healing medicine, if you'd like to explain? OK. Um, well, the basic principle amongst many of the, the sort of complementary and alternative medicines is that the human body has an amazing capacity for self-regeneration. So, for instance, if you cut yourself, the wound heals over given time. Okay. If you suffer a bit of emotional trauma, given time you get over it. Now, if that isn't happening, if the body physically, mentally or emotionally isn't getting over it, then there's something that's stopping the body from sorting itself out. Right. So we go more into Indian and Chinese theories about how energy flows around the body, what they call qi or prana. Now, if there's a physical, mental or emotional issue, that'll actually show up as an energy disruption in the flow around the body. So what we do in bioenergy therapy is identify where this disruption is, return the energy flow to normal using the various techniques, uh, and then that facilitates or just helps the person to, to heal themselves. So all we're doing is facilitating their own healing process. Right, so people already have the ability to do this. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if you're actually giving anything new to them. You are just speeding it up. Yeah, in one sense, it's not, we're not curing them. Uh, it's not a, a miracle cure. We're not claiming that at all. It's just helping the process along. Okay, and so how exactly did you get in to doing this? Uh, well, it was really a sort of process of experience. Um, going back to when I was about 14, my mother used to get very stiff shoulders. Uh, and we had a friend of ours who taught me some massage techniques. Uh -huh. I'd work on my mother's shoulders. My hands would get very hot. And being 14, I didn't really think much of it. That's what happens. Then when I was 18, I started doing martial arts, kung fu, and part of the exercises there, again, my hands would get really hot. So I asked a friend of mine who was a Tai Chi instructor, and I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, that's Chi, energy, coming up in your hands. What, well, what does that mean? What can you do with it? And he said, well, you can do anything with it. So as an 18-year-old, I was going, Cool. And I started experimenting, really. Uh, while I was at university, um, I'd learned meditation, um, I'd learned some acupressure techniques, and started working on friends of mine. Now, initially... So, you say you've learned these techniques, so you mm. actually went on courses at university yeah. to learn more about it? Well, initially it was like there, there weren't many courses around um, to, to learn from, so it was a process of finding some books about um, acupressure, uh, learning to do that, uh, and then just experimenting with friends. And initially it was like, okay, if I press there, that'll stop the pain. Uh -huh. um, if I... But then I asked myself, what would happen if I put some energy into it? And that's when my friends started saying weird things like, oh, it feels like your fingers are going three inches into my body. Or like I was able to start scanning my, my hand about three inches, inches off the body and start feeling shapes like... Imagine as if you put your hand next to a TV screen and you feel the static electricity. I started feeling that around people. And where there was an injury or trauma or where I needed to, to apply pressure, um, that's where the, sort of a, the, the tingly sensation started changing. And I started getting a bit of a reputation around college. Um, about, <laughs> right. yeah, Fantastic. Dan Dan the voodoo man. Yeah. Uh, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, a friend of mine's banging on the door saying, I've got a kidney Male infection. Male or female? Female. Oh, so, so it was a really good, good bang on the it, door. It was an excellent. <laughs> well, two o'clock in the morning, maybe, maybe not. But um, uh, and and she was saying, you know, I've got a kidney infection. I'm in a lot of pain. Can you help? And I'm going, whoa, go go to go to emergency. Go see a doctor. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to hang around emergency for two hours. Can you do something? And I said, I really don't know if I can. I'll try. Got them lying down. Got the hands going. Twenty minutes later, they said, pain's gone. Thank you. And I'm just going, wow. This, this is amazing. I mean, could you actually, when you were doing this, this kind of energy work on yeah. her at the time, could you actually feel that something was happening? Or to you, were you just trying to soothe her and then was amazed at the end of it when she said that she did feel better? No, I could feel something. You can feel it's, it's a variety of sensations like hot or cold or you're feeling shapes in the energy field. Um, and um, it, was, it was really just trying to, to work with that. And, and make it feel like it was going back to normal, like you know, the, the other parts. Uh. So, I mean, essentially, is this some kind of psychic healing? 
Mm, no, it's, it's what, I suppose, bioenergy. Um, the, the, the human body actually generates uh, biochemical fields, bioelectrical magnetic chemical fields around it. So in physics, any, any electromagnetic, any electrical flow will generate a magnetic field. Okay? Mm -hmm. In the human body, you are generating electrical signals along the nerves, through the tissues. That is also generating then an electromagnetic field around the body. That is also going to reflect the state of information or the state of, of uh, energy flow or health that's there. So what we're doing is we're, we're developing a sensitivity that allows us to feel these energy flows and then help them return back to normal. And so I, I started getting very interested in that. But um, at that stage, I'd, I'd made a career decision. Uh, I was being sponsored by the army. Uh, and so I went into the army for five years. And obviously, you can imagine my, my sergeant major sort of being very excited about me, sort of saying, don't worry, sergeant major, I can deal with that chakra. No, I, I had to put that all on the back burner. Uh, and it wasn't until after I left, um, got into uh, IT, did a master's in IT, and I was looking around for something to develop this. I thought, if I have this ability... So you were confident that you had this ability... Yes, and, definitely. ...and it worked. But, definitely. I mean, one thing that you do put forward is that everybody has this ability. You're yes. not some superhuman guru. No, I think everybody has the ability. It's a bit like if you, if you sent 20 people to a gym for a, for a month. By the end of the month, everyone would be fitter, OK? But some would be able to run faster, some would be able to lift more weights. It's very much an individual... Um, you know, some are, are some more, more naturally capable at it, and some need a bit more training and work at it. But generally, everyone has the, the capability. It's just a question of learning how to use it. Right. I mean, for me, it's, it's kind of exciting if this is true, um, because, I mean, we, we are obviously living in a society now that seems saturated with people on medication, people being ill and not getting better, if this is one possible kind of solution mm -hmm. or, or something that can help them. But how is this different from, the, for example, the placebo effect? OK. Um, well, this is part of the question that I was asking myself because I'd had these amazing experiences in terms of, uh, I mean, for instance, myself, I'd had uh, microscopic ulcers of colitis for about two years, had been on the drugs, um, doing the, the normal sort of medical stuff, wasn't getting any better. I went on the, the, the bio or bioenergy course nine months later, had gone into hospital and full remission. And I was getting some really good results uh, with clients of mine. Uh, and I just thought, there is something here. There is definitely something to this. So uh, the last year, what I've done is uh, I've been doing a, a master's degree at Durham University in the history and philosophy of science and medicine, looking at, uh, I suppose, the way orthodox medicine and complementary medicine, um, how there is a struggle between them, how they can help each other. Uh, and I'm looking, hopefully, to, to try and sort of bridge the gap and be able to communicate in the same language from, from both camps. Right. I mean, with regards to bioenergy therapy, mm. um, I mean, Reiki is one type of that, yeah. is it not? And there, there are all different other types of, of, essentially, they've got different names, but they're the same thing. But, I mean, are there not an awful people walking around, kind of Reiki masters after a weekend, um, who think they've kind of got powers to heal people? Isn't that a bit of a dangerous thing? You've got a situation of where, I suppose, you've got people who are, uh, are sometimes, if they've, if they've got a, an illness or a disease, mm. uh, and they're quite scared or they're worried or in a lot of pain, um, that they are vulnerable. Uh, and that there may be people out there who will exploit that vulnerability. Yes, I can heal you. Yes, I can, I can do this. Uh, and so it's very yeah, important. We do, we do hear stories about these kinds of people. And for, for me, that's what I think I'm most wary of, of mm -hmm. vulnerable people being exploited. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you say that you've healed people. Are these cases documented? Well, I wouldn't say I've healed people per se. I've helped facilitate their own healing process. OK. So we've got to be very well, careful about, start. about the words that we use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose the, the, the thing there in, in, in the industry, I suppose, or in, in the, 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 the therapy marketplace, um, you've got standards, uh, you've got controls. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I'm a member of the Biora Foundation, um, which is an organization that trains, is accredited, it has a, an accredited course um, from the Open College Network, which is equivalent to an A-level, so it's nine months of training. Right. Um, that to, in order to be able to call yourself a bio or practitioner, um, you have to uh, sign up to a code of ethics um, that you can't exploit uh, was it your clients, that if it isn't working after a set period of time, you have to say, sorry, stop, 
best to, to, to look at something else. Maybe this isn't working for you. And a lot of times it is about finding right, what so works I mean, for are, that person. Are there, for example, when they go on this course, mm -hmm. are there exams, are there test cases that they have to hand in? Yeah, in order to, to have um, qualified for the Open College Network, etc., cetera, it, um, there are three sets of exams that you have to do. There is a three-hour theoretical exam, there is a uh, four-hour practical exam, and then also you have to do, a, uh, in effect, a dissertation, uh, a case study. So you have to show that you've done uh, appropriate work with six case studies um, and recording uh, about, uh, was it, three, three sessions for each case study. And then this actually then also... So if these people don't feel better at the end of it, have you then failed the course? No, no, that's actually, what was it? If they, see, if they don't feel better, it's, it's not necessarily that you failed, but you've helped them in some way. Either that this isn't working for them, or that they need to find something else, or that there is something else that is going on. And that actually then goes into the database, or the, the, the case histories uh, that we're building up, um, because we're using a, um, a standardized uh, form that registers how people feel before and after. So in, in any sort of, uh, was it, uh, sample of, of clients, um, you're going to get some people who react really well, very strongly, some people that it doesn't work out, for at all, and then sort of in the in the sort of the middle ground, uh, it works for them. Uh, and um, I suppose was it this is this is you getting experience um, of what's going to happen when you you actually practice to be a therapist. It ain't going to work all the time, but when it does, uh, for instance, in my experience in my practice, I've had people who've come to me because they've tried everything on the on the the orthodox side, surgery, drugs, etc., and it hasn't worked. Uh, and then we've tried this, and it has worked for them. Uh, and that's been a major result. Right, so there are actually cases where these people have tried all the other avenues of Western mm -hmm. medicine and as a last resort actually came to you and have benefited from yeah. that. I mean, for instance, I but was... But is that documented? Well, it was literally, I did a, uh, I was on a, a BBC two, 2 documentary about the, um, was it, Private Life of Harley Street. So I was on, I was practicing on Harley Street at the time uh, and they um, followed one of my clients who had... Um, was it endometriosis, so very painful uh, and very heavy periods. Uh, and she'd had uh, several surgeries, uh, and um, it wasn't getting better. And then over a period of about three months uh, working on her, we had on camera a full recovery, uh, and she was, um, you, know, you could see the difference on camera before and after. Uh, and even the camera crew were saying, wow, yeah, we were, we were really impressed with that. And that was on, on BBC Two, no less. Right. And so... Um, <laughs> Basically, getting back to um, the Bioral Foundation and bioenergy medicine in general, how do you know that it's not the placebo effect, the fact that someone comes along, mm -hmm. you're giving them kind of care and attention. I mean, essentially, to someone untrained like myself, it does just kind of look like you're waving your hands around someone, yeah. but in a loving manner. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you know that it's not the kind of time, love and attention that you're giving these people and that's what's making them better mm -hmm. um, psychologically rather than you actually kind of, I don't know, Yeah. Well, the placebo really effect, making them better? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is, this is the very interesting question about the whole thing about placebo effect. The placebo effect itself is hugely powerful. Um, some, some historical commentators on medicine are saying the history of medicine actually is the history of the placebo effect. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Well, up to, I mean, really up to about sort of 1920, um, medicine and science was in a very rough and ready state. And any sort of benefits you were generally getting from it were usually as a result of the placebo effect. Okay. Scientific studies now show that um, um, the best results you get in any, uh, was it, therapeutic encounter is where you have confidence in the doctor or the therapist that is working on you. So, you, you know, it's like a situation where you go into a doctor's and say, you know, how can I feel better? Well, stop smoking and, and lose weight. And there the doctor is, you know, chugging away on, on a fag uh, and sort of hugely sort of obese. I You're not really good. I doctors that smoke. Okay, well, <laughs> but I know yeah. a few. But, um, <laughs> you know, you, ha you won't necessarily have that, that level of confidence in them. Right. Um, so the placebo is very much about almost a... Some commentators would say a, a symbolic system of healing. There are symbols that in medicine you have the symbol of science or you have the white coat or the stethoscope. Um, and these are symbols that I am going to do something to you that is going to make you feel better. Um, and then you do feel better. Now, the huge problem in science is trying to, to sort out what is a causal effect and what is a placebo effect. But what we're now beginning to realize and becoming much more sophisticated is that the placebo effect actually makes you feel better. Why not use it? 
it is actually so powerful that it, it um, well, there, there's, there tends to be a trend in science of where initially when you discover something, you first try and ignore it. And that, that was sort of like medicine up to 1920s. Then when you discover the placebo effect, and this was like you know, experiments in the 1920s, they try and neutralize it because they were finding the placebo was having as just as good an effect as a lot of the pharmaceuticals they were using. Okay. And then we start studying it. And so now we're trying to find out what the factors are in terms of being able to use the placebo effect. Fabulous. Honey, I'll stop you there for a minute because we are about to take a commercial break. Excellent. See you then. Bye. Hiya, uh, it's Frankie again. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to participate in this evening's show, all you have to do is call the number at the top of your screen. Um, calls are charged at a local rate. Basically, you call in and then we call you straight back. So if you've got a question for Dan tonight, perhaps you've had your own experience um, of alternative medicine or essentially, I suppose you'd call it healing, bioenergy therapy. Uh, perhaps you strongly disagree with, with what he does, or there are some questions that you would like to ask him. Either way, do let us know. Just call the number at the top, and we will get back to you. Right. Well, we'll take your call and, and then call you back. Now, Dan, I mean, going back to the placebo effect, one guy that's always really interested me is uh, Dr. David R. Hamilton. Gosh, I forgot his name for a moment there and the work he did. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, Dr. David Hamilton, interesting guy. He used to work in pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, developing and marketing them, uh, and then he sort of really became aware that um, uh, one of the most widely or in-depth studied uh, drugs ever is the placebo, because in every single drug trial that you do, you have to have a placebo. And so he actually became very interested in, uh, in the power of the placebo uh, and wrote a book called It's the Thoughts That Count. And in effect, um, a lot of what any therapy is about um, is your belief in how well um, the therapy is going to work. Uh, and so you get this sort of overlap between therapy and placebo effect, uh, which in, in the end de delivers the result. Right, because I mean, essentially, um, I remember kind of reading that he, a lot of the, the drugs that were being developed were for kind of mental health problems and things like that. And mm. he was finding that the um, results were that the actual medication was only 2% more successful than the placebo, which is barely anything at all. Yeah. Well, the placebo effect has um, different rates of effectiveness depending on the, how was it, I suppose the trial that you're running. So it seems to be most effective in things like mental uh, issues like depression, uh, psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, etc. Um, you're even getting something called uh, placebo drift, where over a period of years, um, the placebo effect is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, which some people think is actually because now people are becoming aware that the placebo effect is, is effective. So now they think, even if I'm getting a placebo, because in a trial you never know what, um, uh, whether you're getting an active drug or a placebo drug, um, that is going to have an effect anyway. And this is called a big problem um, for a lot of the, um, the drug companies because it's getting more and more difficult for them to show their product. Um, actually has a significant effect that can beat placebos. And in fact, placebos are usually uh, better working, less side effects, uh, and just as effective. And then you find in going back into studies like the um, uh, selective serotonin re reuptake inhibitors, they, they are what, own... Say that again, but slowly. The selective <laughs> serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRI, things like Prozac. Okay. okay um, that they were no more effective than the... Uh, prior sort of family of drugs. Um, and what you find is that there's, there's a, a phenomenon called the new, new drug or the new thing on the block of where if it's a new drug, people have more faith in it. It's a symbol of it's new, it's improved, um, therefore it must work better. And then over time, as it gets, becomes, the new drug becomes an old one, its effectiveness decreases. So the whole placebo effect and a lot about any type of healing therapy is about how you believe in that therapy, what, what it means for you. And in fact, it's, some uh, would say that there isn't so such thing as a placebo response, it's a meaning response. What does this mean for you? You will react to that and, and um, gain the healing benefit from it or not. So essentially, I mean, people can become, well, uh, become ill and then get better according to their belief systems. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, you were talking earlier before we were on the show, on the train down here, about essentially when someone's wearing a stethoscope and a long bike coat, that it's almost a ritual and yeah. they have a belief in this ritual, so already 
uh, obviously they do want to get better. Mm -hmm. The people that are treating them want them to get better. So you think that that's quite a, a big part of it as well? Well, there's a whole range of things that, that actually form a part of the, 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 the meaning response. So you've got symbols of healing. So for instance, if I was to give you two aspirins and one aspirin had a red cross on, because we associate that, that symbol with healing, you know, the red cross, first mm. aid, etc., that the, the aspirin with the red cross on would be more effective, it would uh, decrease your pain more, it would work faster. Um, if, but what's also interesting that the placebo effect is different across cultures. So for instance, if I were to give you an injection in America, that would be much more powerful in terms of the placebo effect than an injection in Europe. Right. The color of pills, the size of pills, um, the, the intensity of the operation that's gone you. So for instance, surgery, which is you know, quite a major thing, actually has a very powerful uh, placebo effect. Yeah, because you were saying there was a, a study done with... And do you want to yeah. talk about there that? There were several studies done on, on placebo surgery. So where they did um, uh, basically half the client, was it half the patients, they would actually do the surgical procedure. Uh, one was angina pectoris, so, uh, and the other was on, on knee problems. Uh, and 50%, all they did was actually cut an incision on the person and then just sew them up again. I would have been so annoyed if that was me. <laughs> and right. I got in for an operation and they just well, kind of cut me open and sewed me back up. The person who actually had that, he said, well, I don't care because I feel better. Right. And then they had, you know, a significant uh, percentage of people actually getting better just with the placebo surgery. So it seems like, you know, we are, we are this amazing being. You know, if you think about it, we, we are created from just a couple of cells, grew to be sort of like uh, this, this magnificent sort of human, etc., that's constantly regenerating itself, so that's um, able to self-heal. When, when we can tap into that, that facility, um, there is amazing stuff that, that we can heal ourselves. Um, but then you start getting problems about... Um, you know, can you make money from it? Medicine, as you're saying, is, is almost like a, um, it's like a religion. It, it's not a science, it's not an art. There is a faith that has to go into it right. um, to really make it work. Okay. I mean, I, I definitely think there's something in it. Because, I mean, I remember when I go to my local pharmacy, I was having a chat with my pharmacist who was actually saying that people would come in and uh, buy medicine, and if it was like a generic brand rather than the real brand, the brand everybody knows, they were convinced it was two completely different products, even though it's exactly the same thing, but also convinced that the generic one didn't actually make them any better, whereas yeah. the branded one did. So, But it will, definitely because the marketing, in that sense, is programming you. Yeah, so, I mean, that's interesting. It, you're being programmed by something that is actually, I don't know, people are actually making money from it when yeah. they could be getting it for free. So, the, yeah, the power of belief is a powerful thing. I mean, talking about the history med of medicine, um, can we talk about something juicy for a while? Oh, all right. Bird flu. Bird flu, okay. What, what's going on with, with bird flu? And, bird um, flu. Well, let's take a historical example. It's like the last time we had a major flu epidemic was back in 1918. Um, now, at that stage, um, it was actually a, a worldwide pandemic, um, about 500,000. Americans died from the flu. About 50 million people worldwide uh, succumbed to the flu. Um, what happened was that, in one sense, it was almost like a perfect storm of um, the, the virulence of the flu and also the problems in reacting to the flu. Because at that time, we had the First World War. In America, um, the, the medical system wasn't very good. The level of education had been quite poor up to that point. A lot of the medical facilities had gone over to Europe in order for the war effort. And the, was it, the optimal way of spreading the disease, having a lot of people crammed together in a room, um, was um, the barracks of all the soldiers. And then that got spread around. Um, so what we found there was that actually the orthodox treatment of the day, which was to prescribe an aspirin or quinine um, to try and treat the, uh, the fever, was actually causing more harm than good because the, the actual fever response in the human body limits the growth of the virus. But so by, by bringing down the, uh, the fever, you're actually helping the virus to grow. Um, secondly, um, that uh, homeopathy was having amazing results um, with uh, Spanish flu, uh, and, but the orthodox medical uh, community were just ignoring it because they couldn't understand how it works. So if you can't understand how it works, therefore it must be quacks, it must be charlatans. And yet the, the conventional medicine were having uh, a mortality rate of about 30%. So of 100 people, 30 were dying, whereas homeopaths were reporting uh, a mortality rate of about 1%. So you know, 99 people were surviving 
only one person would be dying in comparison. And this was, this, I suppose I found this really interesting in terms of you had this amazing success of a therapy, and yet about 20 years later, all the homeopathic schools had been closed down in America because, um, because of social, economic, uh, and ideological differences between orthodox medicine and alternative medicine. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there seems to be a massive battle still between the two. Um, I mean, I, you're kind of on the edge, and I know a couple of other doctors who are definitely on the edge and, and think that there's a place for both. Um, but there are a lot of people who, who do think it's a complete scam. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, do you think that there is some kind of hidden agenda or, I don't know, some kind of secret greed? I don't know about hidden agenda, but what you find is there are, there are synergies because of the systems that we have. So, for instance, um, a health system, you know, in a, in a, I suppose, in a capitalist society, works on sickness. It makes profit from selling, selling therapy to sick people. So, therefore, it has an interest in, in having sick people to, to sell to. Um, for instance, in the, in the but, 20s... But, but alternative medicine is not free. No, either. indeed not. Is it? No, uh, that's very true. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that argument really stands up. I mean, it can be quite expensive. It can be, well, it depends on the, the person that you're going to, but also how much you, I suppose, how much you value in, in getting your own self uh, healthy again. Mm. I mean, in, in the UK, we're very lucky in terms of we've got the national health system, and so that will cover the majority of stuff. If in general, that you, when you need to go to a complementary or alternative medical practitioner, you have to pay for yourself. Now, that in itself, you know, if we go back to the placebo effect, is a symbol of you wanting to get better. Uh, and, the, and you having perhaps more, more faith in that particular belief system. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I've had had example of where people have come to me and said, look, I've lost faith in conventional medicine. I'm coming to you first before I do that. Or like I mentioned before, you know, I've tried the, the conventional system, it hasn't worked for me, I'm now going to try this, uh, and it has worked for them. Okay. And, um, yeah, I mean, so going back, bird flu. Yeah. Because you, sorry, but you were, you were saying that actually that's, that is now being considered... Yeah. Um, well, in, in terms of the... It's more frightening for people, th th those in the know, than terrorism. Yes. There was a recent report issued by the Cabinet Office. So they, they did a sort of a threat assessment. What is going to be the most likely and the most damaging um, you know, threat to, to this nation? Uh, and uh, one of the top two, um, one of, not surprisingly, was terrorism, but actually also was uh, bird flu or, or some sort of flu pandemic. And and I, this I, is why I have heard that from other sources mm. as well, actually. Trusted sources, not kind of conspiracy on the internet. But, yeah. I mean, it was obviously a major concern. Well, the thing is, it comes in cycles. Uh, and so if you look at the history of it, uh, generally this flu pandemic generally comes around every 60 years. Uh, and we had the last sort of bout uh, in about 1920, 1918, 1920. So we're overdue for something like that to happen. And this is why organizations like the World Health Organization, the United Nations, various governments, are very concerned about it, are monitoring the situation very carefully, uh, and you know, are going to get in, uh, have mechanisms in place, hopefully, to, to be able to control it as much as we can. Right, and I mean, is there anything that, that you can suggest well, from an yeah, alternative medicine point of view? There's a very good book, actually, by Janie Goddard called uh, The Survivor's Guide to Bird Flu. And it gives a, <laughs> right, excellent. And it gives a whole range of sort of, um, uh, what was it, best practices in terms of diet. Because if you think about your, your health, your health isn't just about you maybe popping a pill, but it's also your lifestyle. So if you're eating healthily, then that is going to give you a stronger immune system. Um, if you do come down with something, what are the, the, the homeopathic remedies that were shown to work in the past? Um, and so then you can use those. Uh, and then even if, if it gets to a situation where it is a, a pandemic uh, and civilization is, well, I suppose normal society is having problems operating, um, what you need to do then to, to operate in a post-apocalyptic situation. Oh, no. To make okay. it really cheerful. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I will stop fear-mongering now. And okay. um, crystal skulls. Right. Right, sorry, this is completely off the subject, but one of the exciting things about Dan's job is that he does get to do some pretty cool off-the-wall things as well. And you were actually um, sent in to guard one of the crystal skulls. Right. Would you like to tell us about that? Well, these things just seem to happen to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I seem to be in the right place at the right time um, with these things. I was um, at a... a, a well, well, first of all, I mean... 
Crystal skulls, just crystal in case skull. our audience doesn't know. Okay, a crystal skull, um, surprisingly, is a skull which is made out of crystal. Now, it can be a variety of types of crystals, like quartz or aquamarine or um, obsidian. Or so. There are a variety of, of crystal skulls, and they can be any size from, you know, so a little one that can sort of fit, fit on, a, on, a, uh, on a mat um, to, I've seen ones about sort of yay big um, that were huge. Um, now, the interesting things about crystal is that Crystal, we use crystal in technology in terms of generating a, a vibration, a frequency. Uh, and on the scientific side, our, what is it? our cellular structure is very similar to liquid crystal. So we can actually tune in uh, and crystals can be shown to have effects on our health systems. Now, crystal skulls are interesting in terms of one, they are usually a big chunk of crystal, so that's going to have an effect on us. The shape that the, the, the crystal skull is in, being a skull, mm. has a very profound symbolic uh, was it uh, meaning for us? Okay, uh, and so what skull were you actually uh, brought well, in to um, guard? Is it was, one that we've heard of? Because there are some famous ones. There are some it famous wasn't ones. The Mitchell, there's, no, Hedges there's one. the uh, yeah, the, the yeah, Hedges Mitchell, as you say. Yeah, sorry, no, it Hedges was Mitchell. not that one. What, what um, but this one is called Harky. Harky, okay. Uh, and it's in a um, it's in a Bond Street Jewelers, uh, and it was uh, basically was it uh, that they found it uh, in a in an auction, uh, and uh, they they thought, well, this is a very in uh, impressive piece, just in terms of its art. Uh, and then they called me in, uh, because they knew that uh, I had some experience with uh, stuff like this, to check it out. Uh, and so we checked it out, and some very Fantastic. interesting things happening. And he will tell you all about it. We're coming up to another commercial break. Uh, if you want to get involved, call the number at the top of the screen. See you in two. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I am with Dan Kahn, who is about to tell us the story of the Crystal Skulls. Carry on, Dan. OK, well, I was at a posh party mm -hmm. uh, and talking to somebody, and they said, well, we've just got this crystal piece in. And I said, well, interesting, you know, you've got to make sure with crystals that you cleanse them properly, usually using sea salt. And they said, oh, well, we'd re need rather a lot of sea salt for this one. So uh, knowing that uh, I was in the sort of the energy field, they asked me to, to come in and consult on this crystal skull. So I did, and I brought a uh, colleague of mine, Elizabeth Brown, uh, who is also a, a master dowser, so she's able to get her rods out and uh, sense energy fields using that. And we went along to this Bond Street jeweler, uh, and uh, they brought out this case, and then brought out from this case this large velvet-covered object, and placed it on the table and un unveiled it. And it was this life-size human crystal skull. And Had you ever heard of the crystal skulls? No, not the, really. The, the I, I think I think you know I'd read about it, let's say, or seen it on Arthur C. Clarke's mysterious uh, thing, and I, and it was very impressive. And also, then suddenly, when you saw it, um, you know, was it? I was talking about the tingling, the, the you know, bang, lots and lots of tingling going all over the place. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth's uh, dowsing rods were going crazy, and um, it was all very interesting. And and they, there is a link there then to. Do you know? Was it the Damien Hurst? Uh, platinum skull. Yeah. Yeah. It was worth like 50 million quid or something. That's it. Yeah. 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 So there was a, there was a link. It was by the same jewelers, uh, and they thought that they they had the crystal skull, and then about uh, a couple of days later, they had the commission from Damien Hirst to do this skull. So they thought there was a definite connection. Um, the the energy was was going sort of crazy in in the room, and um, I started getting this sort of almost like uh, knocking on the side of my head. You know, hello, uh, and I'm going. Elizabeth, and she was going, yes, you know, is the skull trying to communicate with me? And just going, the, the rods were going crazy. Because people have reported mm -hmm. uh, that, that they felt skulls, speak, that the skulls speaking to them. I mean, it's quite a common occurrence, isn't it? Well, it's more that there's, there's inf it seems like there's information that is, uh, that you can access through the crystal skull. Um, so, for instance, a colleague of mine who's a shamanic energy uh, practitioner, um, she you know, there, there was that scene in the Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull uh, movie where Harrison Ford is sort of like gazing deep into the eyes of the Crystal Skull and he's yeah. sort of getting all this information and the sort of communication between it. Well, that was happening between my friend, uh, was it Shannon O'Flaherty, uh, the, the, the shaman, uh, and um, she was sort of getting all this imagery and information sort of what she called downloaded into her. Um, I, what my experience was that I was like almost getting this tapping on the side of my head. Um, we, we confirmed it was like sourcing from, from the skull. Uh, and then I sort of put my hand in front of the skull uh, and felt this uh, invisible but sort of palpable energy egg sort of from in my hand that had sort of come out of the brow chakra between the, between the eyes of the skull. 
and um, like it laid an egg in my, my hand. And then we sort of again... And, we, and you don't actually drink or take recreational <laughs> drugs either. No, no, <laughs> no I, I don't do that, any of that. And, um, uh, but yeah, it was this crazy situation and you know all these sort of very respectable jewelers were standing around with their their mouths agape at sort of all this weird wonderful stuff happening uh, and then the sort of the egg sort of dissolved and the energy went into me and I sort of felt this sort of buzz throughout my body um, so it was it was a one of those weird spooky weird sort of stuff that, that sort of happens so have you do you often encounter stuff like this because you said it quite often happens to you I mean do you think kind of synchronicities I tend to be in the right place at the right time sometimes, so... Right. And have, have, you, have, the, have you actually had any other experiences as exciting as that? Or um, is, is that...? Well, it depends in, in terms of, like, uh, meditation. Uh, I was very lucky to uh, basically come across a very uh, uh, skilled meditation practitioner called Dr. Glenn Morris. Now, he'd come in really from, from the martial arts side, uh, and fantastically... See, my, my life sometimes sounds like a comic book. He was a high-level ninja. And, um, uh, and he cherry-picked various uh, meditation and energy techniques from a variety of, of uh, I suppose, shamanic, martial arts, uh, esoteric practices and put them together mm. as a system. And I was lucky enough to learn from him. Uh, and uh, doing that has, has uh, I mean, for instance, being able, you know, all, entering into altered states of consciousness and sharing dreams uh, with other people where I was doing something in one dream an activity where I'd sort of rescued something and then gave it over to somebody else. And somebody else then sort of came along and said, well, in my dream, you gave me something which you just rescued, and, and I then went off and did something with it. So there's, there's, you know, as Shakespeare says, there is more in heaven and earth than ever our philosophy can show. Brilliant. Thank you. And I, I wanted also, I mean, you talked about kind of the bioenergy therapy. Yeah. And I wanted to point out that that's based on the chakra system. Mm -hmm. um, and so, well, I mean, one of the best books I've ever read is, and I can never remember whether it's Eastern Body or Western Mind. Yeah. Is that, did I get it right? I think you got it right, yes. Okay, by Anna Dea Judith, because quite often I mix it around. Yeah. Um, and she uh, is a, a clinical psychologist, I yeah, believe? Yeah, she's a, a psychologist, but also an energy worker, a body yeah. worker. And a, a kind of does shamanic practices as mm -hmm. well. And, um, I mean, one of her, her book about, about kind of like the chakras and um, essentially the psychology of them, so, I mean, could you talk us through the seven chakras and, mm -hmm. and what they represent and kind of the, the illnesses that are associated okay. with them? Well, we use the chakra system as a framework. So it's a, it's a way of understanding what's going on in, in the system. Um, so there is... Wait, shall, we, shall I stand up? Okay. So I'm going to show everybody my chakras. Right. So, so I'll stand up okay. and you can kind of point out where they would be. All right. So essentially in this particular belief system... My root chakra is kind of down here, coming okay. out there. So your root, root chakra right. is yeah. going to be at the base of the spine. So okay. it's down at the base of the spine. And the root chakra is usually, on a, on a physical basis, it's the heavier stuff. So bones and blood, um, teeth, that sort of thing. So if we've got a broken bone um, or maybe a blood issue, then the energy around that area would tend to sort of be uh, distorted. Um, if on a mental, emotional basis, then was it the primary thing is about survival? So survival, fear, money, career, that sort of thing. If we go to the sacral chakra, mm -hmm. okay, so that's just about sort of underneath the belly button, okay, that's much more about our emotions and about pleasure. Um, so if we're having issues about uh, uh, the amount of pleasure we're getting in life, um, we'll feel a sort of disruption there. Or it can be about digestion, the stomach, the, the, the guts there. The solar plexus chakra, funnily enough, is in the solar plexus. So just underneath the rib cage um, is the solar plexus. And that okay. is about the, the, the power that we have. One second. So excitingly, yeah. we have Dave from Suffolk on the phone. Hello, Dave. Hello. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hello. Hello. I'm very well, thank you very much. Brilliant. And first of all... Yes? First of all, Frank, I'd like to congratulate you for being... Um, for questioning and asking for... Um, verification of these things. Oh, thank you very um, much. That's all right. And you're totally hot, by the way. But oh, anyway. <laughs> thank you. I'd agree with that. <laughs> I, I would like to ask... I was going to ask your... Um, Dan. I was going to ask your guest... Oh, forget about um, him. <laughs> yeah, no, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask your guest uh, whether he felt any kind of kinship to Wilhelm Reich and what he was doing. But since listening to him, um, what I'd like to ask him more than that is whether this uh, course he's been on, which is equivalent to an A-level, which I don't find very uh, reassuring, 
Whether he thinks that that is actually just a load of rubbish and he's actually conning people into making themselves feel better through the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much for that. So, essentially, what do you think of Reich and also, I mean, do you think, essentially, the course that you've gone on and now teach your conning people? Exactly, <laughs> yes. Now, it's a good, good direct question. All right, I'll sit down for this one. Um, <laughs> Sorry, is it, was it, what's the name of the person? The Dave. Dave Ike. Yes. David Icke. Uh, no, it was not David Icke. <laughs> no? Oh, right, <laughs> no. Dave. Um, yes, no, it was Dave from Suffolk. Thank you for your compliments, Dave. Right. Dave's all right, as far okay. as I'm concerned now. Good. Yes. Um, so, essentially, first of all, Reich, because, I mean, that was the first question he asked. What do you think of Wilhelm Reich? I'm, I oh, Wilhelm, oh, okay, yeah. Wilhelm Reich. Um, the, uh, well, he was, a, he was a, a very respected scientist of his time, uh, pre-war years in the 30s. Uh, and he was um, studying energy, or go what he called orgone energy, O-R-G-O-N-E, um, and very similar to, to bioenergy principles. Um, so I think that leads nicely into, um, is bioenergy and, and the courses that we run um, uh, a fake? Well, I had that experience in terms of the doubt, because, because of my background, let's say, in the Army. You know, the Army is a very grounded, sort of, um, uh, very pragmatic, uh, sort of culture, not not very huggy feely. So when I sort of first sort of uh, started learning about this, I was one. I was worried about cults. You know, I, I I didn't want to get involved with anything like orange robes, tambourines. Secondly, I was very concerned about their belief system because I didn't want to get involved with aliens sending love energy from Venus. And thirdly, I didn't want to get defrauded. So I went along to a one-day workshop, and I thought, okay, if I'm going to, you know, do this, I'll just do one day. Can't be too much. And they. I did some of the techniques they, saw, they, they taught, and as I was doing it, I could see this red glow around my hand, this vivid red glow. And I was like, excuse me, it was like the Ready Breck kid, if you remember that. And I was saying to the instructors there, excuse me, but should I be seeing a red glow around my hand? And they were going, yes, that's your aura. Now, I'd never seen that before. And this was, you know, sense data for me. This was an empirical experience that either I was hallucinating or there was something to this. So I decided to explore, to experiment in you know, good scientific fashion. Let's see what happens. And I went on the course. Um, and in terms of the, the accreditation or the A level, it's you know it is taught in a very structured and comprehensive manner, which is um, uh, therefore can be accredited by the Open College Network. Uh, and um, I myself had, had had then sort of a full remission from two years of, of quite a nasty uh, inflammatory disease. Right. So, so I, for myself it worked, yeah. for, for other people it worked, and I'd had these amazing experiences which I couldn't, couldn't doubt. Okay, fantastic. Now, next on the line, I believe we've got Ian from Cardiff. Hello, Ian. Hello. Hello, how are uh, you? Yeah, not so bad, thanks. Quite enjoying your interview. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, I have a question for Dan. She goes right back to the beginning of the programme when he mentioned that... Um, human flesh or injuries will always heal themselves or the, um, the regeneration of tissue in short. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but in the case of emphysema when the lung tissue is damaged, have you ever known of uh, lung tissue being regenerated or is that yeah, an impossibility? Okay, thanks for that, Ian. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so have you emphysema, lung tissue, can that yeah. actually, are there, can everything be regenerated or, or healed essentially mm -hmm. um, well, or, if we think or it, are there only some things? It all, like most of these things, it all depends. Um, in, if we, you know, scientific studies show that um, when they use radioisotopes to track how many cells are replaced in our body, uh, that shows that we replace up to 98% of our, of our molecules um, every year. So it's almost like you're getting a new car every year and just the, the, the key stays the same. So the, the, the regenerative capacity of the human body is absolutely astounding. Um, there's, there's also other phrases, you know, every seven years you get a totally new body. You are continuously taking in new material, you know, by eating or drinking, continuously getting rid of old material. Oh, the only thing that stays the same is the structure. Now, with, I've now in my personal experience, I haven't treated emphysema. So do, you, do you know anybody that has? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I could, I could find out and, and we could get back to, to uh, Ian uh, from that. But I think my, my general attitude is all things are possible, but not necessarily probable. It depends on a variety of factors. You know, imagine you've got a regeneration rate, 
Okay. Um, but then also there's a degeneration rate. So, mm -hmm. for instance, um, let's see, was it, um, you know, there's been injuries, but then also you're doing, uh, having a good diet, you're very positive, um, you're, you're sort of uh, taking bioenergy therapy. It's all a question of being able to get your regeneration rate higher than your degeneration rate. Um, and that, that taking into account a whole lifestyle. So, But surely yes. someone would, with emphysema, you mm -hmm. would actually say, go and see, no offence, but a proper doctor. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say do a, do a sort of dual track. So go see a proper doctor, um, have the treatment there, because obviously it, it can be quite a serious condition, um, uh, but also try at the same time um, having the, the, the bio or the bioenergy therapy or, or something that you really believe in, because that will increase the probability that you're going to have a positive response from any sort of therapy. Okay. Okay, we now have John from London on the line. Okay. Well, we weren't sure if we were getting him for a moment there. Hello, John, what's your question for Dan this evening? Hello, first of all, I wanted to say very, thank you very much for Dan for talking about the placebo effect. Uh, many times when people say placebo, it is a way of dismissing something that has actually worked for other people. Mm. Uh, I really thought that was great because actually if somebody looks at uh, what is in our pharmacies, and some of our hospitals, most of it is placebo. Yeah. I mean, what are called remedies after all? And what is palliative cure? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Dan also, I think, uh, uh, the issue about energy, uh, and I just wanted to test something with you. About 10, 10 years ago, I was suffering from migraines, and uh, the medicines I was taking didn't seem to have any impact at all. And I decided to actually put John, up with the pain and feel John, the pain. John, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to kind of wrap it up because we're coming to the end of the show, um, which is a real pity because we didn't get to hear the rest of that story. But, yeah, thank you so much for your contribution, Dan. I mean, John, as well as, well as Dan. Thank you. So, I mean, Dan, to sum up, is there anything kind of that you'd like to leave us with? Um, probably was it in terms of the placebo effect that um, it's, it's, there's a joke about the, the, the doctor in terms of... Okay, it's the end of the show. See you next week.